So today we're going to talk about the um, Jehovah Witness. Um, it does. This talk does pretty much take me most of the time to get through. We're starting a little bit late, so I'll try to be done um, on time. Um, but today we're going to talk about the Jehovah Witness. So first, I want to re reiterate a few points that I made last week. So. Whenever you're talking with a people of other faith traditions, whether it's the Mormons like last week or the Jehovah Witness this week, it's very important that we know our own Catholic faith first. Be, uh, know our faith, um, have an encounter with Christ, know God, continue to know him more and more, and then live your faith so you can be a good witness and a good example for the people you're talking to. But it's really important to always know our own faith first, strive to be living holy lives um, so that no matter what, no matter what dialogue and what happens as a result of it, we can still be good witnesses um, to other people about, about our faith. Um, secondly, I want you to kind of put out of your mind the Mormons because Jehovah's Witnesses are very different, um, completely different um, set of beliefs. Um, there'll be very few similarities in some ways, but in general, kind of put them out of your mind. It is going to be a totally um, different tradition that started. Um, so ha keep having that in mind. As we approach Jehovah's Witness, like with the Mormons, um, it's important to at least know a little bit about their faith tradition when you dialogue with them. Um, because like with the Mormons, make sure they define terminology. Because when they say God the Father, or Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, or the Bible, or if they talk about the Incarnation, they may mean something completely different than what we as Catholics mean. And so it's important in your conversation to really make that clear from the beginning so that there's no confusions or assumptions that are made. Um, then the Jehovah Witness and the Mormons are both post-Reformation traditions. So all of them have some Protestant ideas, some Protestant notions. Um, but again, they basically both splinter off in different directions. You have the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant groups, and the Mormons and, and Jehovah Witness are kind of different branches that go off in different directions. One of the things that I will add, um, last week with the Mormons and this week with Jehovah Witness, one of the things we can imitate and admire is they're very, very zealous for their faith. That's one thing we can definitely give them credit for. Um, they definitely go out and are very active evangelizers. Um, some Jehovah Witness will spend 60 to 100 hours a month evangelizing. Sometimes it's door to door, sometimes it's just in public settings. But um, similar with the Mormons who require you know, their, their children two years to go and evangelize. So I think it's something we can definitely imitate. Um, but having said that, you're going to see that there's a lot of differences um, in the Catholic understanding of truth than what the Jehovah Witness teach. Um, and I'm going to try as best I can to be as faithful to what the Jehovah Witness actually do teach, just like I tried to be last week with the Mormons. Um, you know, I'm, I never ha was in either one of these different traditions, but I'm trying to be as faithful as I can. Um, and there's nothing that I intend to do to bel belittle them or, you know, uh, this is what they believe. I'm just going to basically present it as this is what they believe. Um, and then we can kind of hopefully um, use that and then take that into dialogue with them to share the, the truth of our Catholic faith with them. One of the things with both of these groups, let me flip through the slides real quick. Um, this is just the summary of knowing your faith, have some understanding of the tradition, and then making sure that you have them define terminology. Um, one of the things with um, Jehovah Witness that's important when you're dialoguing just like with the Mormons and other different faith traditions, you can definitely say no thanks when they come and want to talk with you. But I would encourage you to learn about these traditions and have dialogue. Because if they don't hear the truth from us, they may not ever hear it from anyone. And so last week and this week hopefully can expose you to some foundational understanding to give you some f knowledge and some courage to be able to communicate and dialogue with them. But when you approach them, you don't want to necessarily say, boom, 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 here's a ton of different scripture verses that you have wrong or there's a ton of different scripture verses that we disagree on, know that it's going to be a gradual process. And you want it to be a gradual process because I think that's when it will sink in most effectively. If you go step by step, very slowly, and what you really want to do is to help them come to conclusions on their own. Because if you just tell them, well, this is the right interpretation, they're not necessarily going to believe you just because you say it. Um, so if you can kind of establish a relationship to some degree with them, um, spend hours talking or, or days or weeks, just take time, know it'll be gradual, and don't become frustrated with that. Um, that's a good thing. As long as they're willing to dialogue with you, continue to dialogue with them. Um, <clears throat> 
And then you always, always want to take your conversations to prayer. Pray with them if, if that's an option. If not, at least praying before and after um, your encounter with them to the Holy Spirit to guide, to guide you um, because you're there to plant seeds. The Holy Spirit's the one that's going to convert hearts, so we keep that in mind and always take it to prayer. So now to get started with the Jehovah Witness specifically, I'm going to give you, um, kind of like last week, give you a little bit of background about the origins, how it began, and then we'll talk about different beliefs. And then as we go along, I'm going to do a little differently than last week, but with each belief, I'm going to show you some counterpoints that you can make with them to kind of help challenge them and question them um, about their beliefs. And you want to try to do it in a question-answer um, format, so you can maybe say, well, you know, this is this scripture passage, what do you think about this? Um, or, you know, this is my understanding of this scripture passage, what, do you, how, what is your understanding? And just kind of make it a question answer so it's nothing like you're being really attacked, you don't want to attack them um, and just kind of overwhelm them. They'll just make, that'll make them more closed-minded. You want them to stay open, continue dialogue. Um, so with the Jehovah Witness, their origins, with this we have to take one step back. Um, they're found, they're, one of their founders is Charles Russell, but we have to take a step back, um, so slightly before Charles Russell, so we can see even where he kind of, what he kind of got into as he was growing up. So this takes us to a person, a man named William Miller. Um, he was born in 1781, and then he lived through the 1800s, um, the first half of the 1800s. Um, he was a Baptist preacher, and on his own, he started to study the scripture, and through a brief study, he started examining all the prophecies of the Old Testament. And he concluded that all these prophecies must be fulfilled either in Christ's first coming or Christ's second coming. And so all the ones that had not yet been fulfilled in the first coming, he said, well, these are all going to be fulfilled in the second coming. So using all these different prophecies, um, he then determined by his calculations that Jesus Christ's second coming would happen in March of 1843. And he actually gained over 50,000 followers. Um, they were called the Millerites. Um, you may have heard about them. But he gained large numbers, and they all believed the world would, uh, that the Jesus' second coming would be in March of 1843. They prepared, they changed their life, they did a lot of drastic things in preparation for this day. However, in March of 1843, nothing happened. Uh, William Miller and some of his disciples, um, they said, well, my cal our calculations had been off. So they recalculated it, examining scripture. They came up with March of 1844. Then they said, oh, wait a minute, that's off also 18, October 1844. That's the date. That's when the second coming will happen. And again, a lot of preparations for, were made by all of their followers. But then again, nothing happened in October 1844. So what happened as a result is you have multiple, multiple splinter groups that formed. All the large numbers of followers split off into different groups. They all then started making their own calculations about the second coming and the end of the world. Um, and this is when you hear the word Adventists. That's kind of a um, general, general name for all these different splinter groups. So the Seventh-day Adventists fall into this category, and there are several others that fall into this category of Adventists. They branch off from Will William Miller and his followers, and they all go and start to make their own predi predictions. Well, then Charles Russell is born in 1852 in Pennsylvania. Charles Russell um, grew up Presbyterian. He was around the age of 11. The Battle of Gettysburg took place near his home, and so he was exposed to a lot of death um, with that, and it affected him um, deeply. And so a few years later, around the age of 16, he started to really question and doubt. He started to lose his faith. He started to question things about God and about his, about his religion and about his faith. In this process, he came across a group of Adventists, and he was really enthralled. I mean, he was really engaged. He started studying with them, meeting with them, going to a lot of their Bible studies. Over time, over several years, he eventually became um, a well-respected leader among this particular Adventists group. He um, became uh, well-known. He started studying and leading studies. He started atten attending their meetings. Um, this group was particularly making a prediction that Christ's second coming, coming would happen in 1874. This, one of the leaders of that group, his name was um, Nelson Barber. Um, Nelson Barber, um, again, nothing happened in 1874. So they predicted it. They were all excited. 
plan their lives around this date, nothing happened in 1874. Well, Nelson Barber um, wrote a, a magazine called The Herald of the Morning. And what he said was actually Christ had come in 1874, but it was invisible. It was an invisible second coming, but he had come. Well, Charles Russell believed this. He agreed with this. He actually started writing a lot of pamphlets for this Adventist group, putting out, putting out this message. He wrote for Herald of the Morning as well, um, many, many different articles for them in support of the different beliefs that the Adventist group held, including Nelson Barber and his belief that Christ had come in 1874, but had come invisibly. But over time, um, Charles Russell started to question some of the things that the group was teaching, including that Christ had come invisibly in 1874. So he eventually rejected this idea, and then he himself left this group and split off. And then he left along with his father, and then another couple named William and Sarah Conley, and then several others left. And they went and formed their own little splinter group. And they started studying and doing their own Bible studies um, and making their own predictions. Charles Russell, in 1879, started his own magazine called Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. This is later what, we, what will be called the Watchtower. That will be an important point here in a little while for the Jehovah Witness, but the Watchtower. He again starts teaching that Christ's second coming did happen in 1874. He now again is teaching and believing that Christ came invisibly in 1874. He starts to spread his beliefs throughout the East Coast. He goes from group to group. He was seen as a pastor um, and really developed a, a pretty large following. The group of people that followed him came to be known as Russellites, or his group was called Russellism. Um, they also were known as the Bible Students. And then ultimately, this group is what would be called Jehovah's Witnesses. This name would be um, take place in 1931, but it's the same group of people. And I'll come back to show why that name came about, but um, they were called the Bible students or Russellites. They followed him. He had a fairly large following, really, um, that developed following him and believing everything that he taught. Then in 1916, Russell died. His successor was a man named Joseph Rutherford, or sometimes called Judge Rutherford, um, and not everyone was happy with this selection of a successor, and so splinter groups started to form but the largest group still stayed with Joseph Rutherford. And so um, over time, you have different presidents of what would be called the Jehovah Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses give a formal list of their presidents. Um, some people dispute this list, but their list that they give so that says that their first president was Charles Russell, the second was Joseph Rutherford, the third was a man named Nathan Knorr, fourth was Frederick Franz, fifth Milton Henschel, and then the list goes on and on. These names will come back here in a minute. These last three presidents um, down the road will come back. Um, but these are some of their presidents, um, and this was the primary group that, that is the Jehovah Witness today. Um, Joseph Rutherford is the one who eventually changes their name to Jehovah Witnesses in 1931 because there was all the different splinter groups that had formed were also still calling themselves Bible, Bible students, and so he wanted to make sure that there was a distinguishing name for the group that truly was with Rutherford um, the successor of Charles Russell. So that's a brief background um, of what, how their origins happened. We're going to start to talk more about what it is they believe. And as with every faith tradition, it's important to focus on authority. What's their authority? Um, who is it they trust? Who is it they believe? The Jehovah Witness do believe, and, and we're going to get to this in a minute, but they believe in God the Father, and they believe he's unchanging and he's eternal. So they believe that um, ideas cannot just change back and forth, but they gradually develop, and over time the ideas are gradually revealed um, to the authority that we'll talk about. They believe that God has a channel of communication to us on earth, and this channel initially was Joseph, or Charles Russell himself, and then over time this channel of communication between God and us is called the governing body. The governing body is typically made up of 12 men, but the number varies. They, they say that they have apostolic authority. They meet and they determine doctrine with a two-third vote. They're based in Brooklyn, New York. And then they publish what's called the Watchtower. The Watchtower is something that comes out every single month. 
And this is how the average person knows what it is that God is teaching us. So the governing body um, is the channel of communication for God, and their publication is the watchtower to be able to distribute God's message to everybody. <clears throat> and so um, the watchtower and the governing body are in many ways a unit. Um, everything the watchtower says is what the governing body is saying, and that's what God is telling them. And they're seen as the faithful slave of God. So quoting, and I'm going to use a lot of quotes from their own sources, and when you talk with them, it's very important to use their own sources because that's all they trust. They will think everything else is deceiving them and everything else is from Satan, so they trust the governing body and the watchtower. So as often as you can use those, it's, it's helpful. Um, but the watchtower describes um, the governing body and these men and says um, that it is vital that we appreciate this fact and respond to the directions of the slave as we would to the voice of God. And the slave is the governing body and the watchtower. So they, it's just showing evidence. They believe that is the voice of God that we must obey and listen to. Another quote, <clears throat> the watchtower is not the instrument of any man nor any set of men. No man's opinion is expressed in the watchtower. God feeds his own people through the watchtower. Those who, those who oppose the watchtower are not capable of discerning the truth. I don't know if y'all can see that or not. We can probably turn the lights down if you can't. But, um, and so again, just more evidence that the watchtower is their source for truth. It's their source for where they're getting revelation from God. And then the third quote, that God has provided this visible organi organization to the governing body through the watchtower, made up of spirit-anointed ones to help Christians in all nations to understand and apply properly the Bible in their lives. Unless we are in touch with this channel of communication that God is using, we will not progress, no matter how much Bible reading we do. So it again shows you how really they put a lot of emphasis on the watchtower and what it is they're telling them, that they need the watchtower to interpret scripture, they need the watchtower to tell them how to live, because it's good to read the Bible, but no matter how much we read the Bible, if we're not in touch with the watchtower, then we're not going to progress on, this, in, on the road of life. With their scriptures, it's a, it is their second source of authority. So our first authority is God talking to the governing body in the watchtower. And then their second source of authority is the scripture. They do believe that in scriptures are inspired by God. Their, their scriptures are called the New World Translation. This is a very unique translation. Um, the translation was done by the Watchtower Society itself. <coughs> they, they do not list who the translators are. They say that we're going to leave them unnamed because God is to be given all the credit, not men. Um, so unfortunately, not knowing who it was, you don't know how qualified they were in biblical languages. You really don't know their expertise. You really don't know much about them, um, and they will not reveal their names. However, there have been some former, ex um, former Jehovah Witnesses who have left who have revealed their names. Um, Jehovah Witnesses will not say whether or not this is ac actually who it was or not. Um, so when, when I've asked them about it, they just ignore the question. So this is who they've be revealed the names. Um, so three of them were former presidents um, and then just some other men. Um, and when you look at the history of these men, they really didn't have any expertise in biblical languages um, at all. But this is who former witnesses have said did the translations, but we can't really verify that. And Jehovah Witnesses do not trust former witnesses. Um, they will absolutely have nothing to do with former Jehovah Witnesses. Um, <clears throat> so with the New World Translation, um, it has 66 books. So like the um, typical Protestant Bible you may see today, it has the same 66 books as the Protestant Bibles. Um, <clears throat> The translation itself was made in 1950. Prior to 1950, they used the King James Version um, or they used an American Standard Version. But since 1950, they've used the New World Translation. And there, is, there are updates every, every so often of the New World, New World Translation that they make. Only this translation is accurate. Every other translation they see is corrupt. So if you're talking with them and using your Bible, they're not going to trust it. Um, because it's corrupted in their mind, and it's just something that's deceiving them. So they'll only use their translation. They are encouraged to read the Bible. They do see that the Bible is a gift from God, 
but they need the watchtower to help them interpret it. <clears throat> as you will see as we go along, their Bible translation is, is very biased, and it definitely does support their doctrines. They've made a lot of changes throughout Scripture um, to support their doctrines in various ways. Sometimes it's subtle, um, sometimes it's not so subtle, um, but it does support their doctrines. And so whenever you're talking with them, it is important to be a little familiar with what their Bible says. And it's easily, you can find it online, it's easily accessible online. But you can see what their Bible says compared to yours, you'll know what their argument's going to be. Because they'll say, they'll have all these different reasons um, for different doctrines, and they'll use their scripture. But we'll talk about more examples as we go along. So we're going to come back to um, the New World Translation as we go along through different doctrines. That's the brief overview of the authority. So governing body and watchtower, <clears throat> number one, and then scriptures, the New World Translation, their own unique version translation of scripture. So now to talk about some of their beliefs. So God, um, they believe God the Father, and they believe he alone is almighty God. He is pure spirit. He is eternal He's unchanging. He gives revelation to men gradually. They do not believe in the Trinity. The Trinity to them is a doctrine of Satan. They believe that the God is his title, but his name is Jehovah. And they believe that it's wrong to not call God by his name, Jehovah. If you do not call him Jehovah, Jehovah God, then you're, being un you're under the influence of Satan. So if you're not using that for God, um, that's how they identify those who are under the influence of Satan. So Jehovah, this name of Jehovah, where does that come from? <clears throat> in the Hebrew language, so in the Hebrew Old Testament, there were no vowels. So you would see Y-H-W-H. -H. Um, this four-letter word is whenever God revealed to Moses his name, I am who am. So this four-letter word did not have vowels. It used to be pronounced by the Jewish people thousands of years ago, and most scholars believe that the, per, the correct pronunciation is Yahweh. And you can spell it either of two ways, of Yahweh. But that most scholars do not believe that the proper pronunciation is Jehovah. That's something that kind of came over time. Um, but we do not know, actually, what the proper pronunciation is, because um, hundreds of years um, before Christ, Jewish people stopped calling God by his name Yahweh out of reverence. Because out of extreme veneration, they stop pronouncing it. So over time, people really lost any understanding of how this word was pronounced. Um, in our English language, we add the vowels. And we add the vowels that we believe that scholars say is probably the most accurate. Um, but in Hebrew, there were no vowels. And so we don't really know exactly how it's pronounced. Um, and, and so the only people that would pronounce it would be the priests in the sanctuary, um, but any other time, if they were publicly reading scripture or publicly talking about God in a reverent way, they would use the Hebrew word Adonai, which in Greek is Kyrios, and which in English is Lord. That would be the most common. There are several other words they would substitute instead of Yahweh because they were afraid of saying God's name in vain. They were afraid of using God's name improperly, and so they stopped using it publicly. Um, the priests occasionally would use it in the sanctuary, but other than that, it was pretty much they would substitute it. And so what happened is over time, the Hebrew scriptures even took the, um, the Yahweh, those four, word, those four letters, out and put Adonai instead so that when they were reading in the sanctuary, they wouldn't accidentally say the word Yahweh. You know, some people say it was just that the Jewish people went overboard with doing it, but whatever the reason, it did start to disappear from the Hebrew scriptures, um, even though we know that Yahweh was there um, originally. So that's where the word Yahweh comes, and Yahweh is based on our pronunciation, um, but they claim that Jehovah is actually the proper pronunciation and the proper spelling um, for God's name. And they say that you must call God by Jehovah, and to, do, to not do so is wrong. Um, and they believe the Jewish people were wrong for not doing that. Um, but they also believe that, um, well, let me go into a little bit more. They also, with their New World Translation, to kind of confirm this belief, They've gone and anywhere in the Old Testament where the, the four-letter word Yahweh had been removed, they add it back in, which is okay because it does belong in the Old Testament. There are places where we know that four-letter word did exist. So they've gone back and restored that four-letter word, though they, they put Jehovah 
instead of putting Yahweh like we would in um, the Catholic scriptures, they put Jehovah. So everyone in the Old Testament, they restore it, but that's not incorrect or wrong to do. That's okay. And scholars would say, well, we can't be 100% certain that Jehovah isn't correct, but they definitely strongly favor that it's not. So in the Old Testament, they've gone and restored Jehovah. Where they've almost, where the scholars say they've gone too far is Jehovah Witness have gone in and they've added the word Jehovah to the New Testament as well in the New World Translation. And what this will do is this confirms many of their teachings about who God is and who Jesus is because they selectively add the word Jehovah in the New Testament. But they claim they're restoring it, that in the second and third century when the Bibles were corrupted, this word was removed from the New Testament, that it was always there. So they add the word Jehovah in 237 places in the New Testament. The problem is, is that this word, if you want to say Jehovah, this is a Hebrew form of God's name. The New Testament was written in Greek. The Gospel of Matthew, scholars say it's possible that was written in Aramaic, but otherwise the rest of the scripture was written in Greek. So they wouldn't have used this Hebrew form of God's name, even if they had included it um, in their writings. Although the um, Jehovah's Witnesses say that's wrong, that they, w they did put it in there, that they did put the Hebrew name of God in the Greek scriptures, but there's no evidence for that. If you look at different journals, the Journal of Biblical Literature, it's listed over 5,200 fragments of the Greek New Testament, and nowhere in these fragments is there any suggestion that the word Jehovah or Yahweh was ever in the New Testament. Um, they have fragments from 300 A.D., they have fragments from 200 A.D., there's even some small fragments of John's writings from around 25 to 50 years after he wrote it, so around 150 A.D., and there's absolutely no indication the word Jehovah was in the New Testament. We can also look to the church fathers because they often quote scripture when they're writing, and there's no evidence that they're, when they quote scripture that Jehovah or Yahweh was ever in the New Testament. Plus, if there was this big conspiracy about removing the name of God from the New Testament, the church fathers would have talked about it. You would have expected to hear them saying, talking about some big conspiracy of corrupting the Bibles, removing the word Jehovah. So there's a lot of evidence that this is an incorrect notion, but they continue to support it and believe it. And it ends up becoming a, a, a critical issue when you're talking with them about who God is and who Jesus is, um, because as I said, it's very selectively um, chosen as to when the word Jehovah will be used. It's never used for Jesus because they do not believe Jesus is God, which we'll get to in a minute. It's only used for God the Father, and so it becomes difficult with dialogue if you're not aware of it. The evidence they use as to this is why it's okay for us to put Jehovah in the New Testament is because they use, there's these Hebrew translations were made in the 1300s. They took the Greek New Testament, and some different scholars made a Hebrew version of the New Testament. But it's 1,300 years after Christ and after the original books were written. So, you know, these translations can even be called into question. But these Hebrew translations do add in the Jehovah anywhere that um, certain words were used for God. However, and so the Jehovah Witnesses say, see, these Hebrew versions are doing it, so we're okay to do it. However, they're still selective because even in these Hebrew versions that use Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses will only use it when it's referring to God the Father. These Hebrew versions do call Jesus Jehovah, but they refuse to put Jehovah in association with Jesus. So they're still very inconsistent even when they're using these Hebrew versions of when they use the word Jehovah. So of the 237 uses in the New Testament of Jehovah, 83 have absolutely no support from anywhere to use them. So many of the others have some support from some of these Hebrew translations, but you can still call into question whether or not these are really valid. But I'm not going to spend too much more time on that. I just wanted to kind of let you know and be aware that that, it, that may be an issue in your dialogue with them is, is this idea of Jehovah. Um, one of the points you can bring up with them is if Jehovah is so important to call God by that name, then why did Jesus never call God the Father by Jehovah? Because Jesus never did. He always called him God the Father or Abba or um, 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 Holy Father, Lord of heaven and earth. He never called God Jehovah. And when Jesus teaches us how to pray, how does Jesus tell, teach us how to pray in Matthew and Luke? He says, our Father. We are to call him our Father. He never says to use Jehovah. So you can definitely you know, call, bring that into their mind and ask them, how is it that Jesus never teaches us to pray using Jehovah if it's that critical and that important? Um, but if you wanted to kind of have an example of one of um, their uses of Jehovah selectively, um, in Romans chapter 10, 
verses 9 and verses 13, this word kyrios in Greek is the one that they'll say that sometimes means Jehovah. So in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 13, kyrios is used twice. They translate it for as Lord anytime it refers to Jesus and as Jehovah anytime it refers to um, God the Father or if it seems to be calling Jesus God, they always translate it as Lord. Um, so Romans 10 um, and Romans 14 there's several places that they do this inconsistently. And when you read it in context, it makes absolutely no sense. Because it's talking about Jesus, 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 Jesus. Then all of a sudden, God the Father is called Jehovah. Um, so Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. Je- Je- um, so then they, they talk about some other comment, Jehovah, God. And so it's very inconsistent, very confusing. Um, if we have time at the end, I can, we can pull up those passages. Um, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, Okay, so for the Holy Spirit, moving on past um, that, the Holy Spirit to them is not a person. It's not a God. The Holy Spirit is simply an active force. It's just what God uses to accomplish his will. So it's just a force, not a person, not a God. I'm not going to go into this. I'm just going to throw this up there if you want to watch it on video. There are things you can use that show the Holy Spirit has personal characteristics. And in Acts 5, the Holy Spirit is called God. Um, so you can definitely look at that, look that up. There's definitely ways to counter this argument about the Holy Spirit. But for time's sake, I'm not going to spend time on it. Um, Jesus, who is Jesus? So as I mentioned um, earlier, Jesus is not God to them. Um, Jesus is considered divine, and Jesus is considered a God, but they say this is in the same sense that you can call angels divine or angels gods. Jesus is not God, and he's not equal with God the Father. Before I go on to who Jesus is, one of the things that I want to bring up, when you read a lot of the former Jehovah Witnesses books and um, internet sites, they all say to be very careful in discussing the Trinity and the deity of Christ because this probably will only get you into trouble initially because they say that they are very, very well versed in how to defend the idea that the Trinity is wrong and that Jesus is not God because they use their own scripture which in every, most, of the, most of the verses we will use to support that Jesus is God have been changed. Not all of them, but most of them. So they're very, they're very well versed. They can throw out a lot of scripture to you to show that Jesus is not God. Um, and so they all recommend that it's probably not good to engage in, a, in this conversation initially. So the Trinity and the deity of Christ hold off until later um, in your dialogue because otherwise you'll just keep them closed-minded. They only trust their Bible version And that Bible version does support um, these doctrines largely. It's appealing to us because it's so important to us, but it's going to probably make them close-minded, and you want to address some other things before you get to that point. Eventually, you can bring that up. Um, So before I go any further, I'm just going to let you know that's probably what a lot of these former Jehovah Witnesses recommend because they say in their conversations when they were still Jehovah Witnesses, immediately they would not listen to this person anymore because they knew they could... Defend, defend their own belief about who Jesus is and who God is. Um, so they say there's other things you should start with that we'll come back to. I'll tell you what those are in a little bit. Okay, so back to who Jesus is. Um, so he's not God. Um, he's not equal to God. And this is one example of just showing you how it becomes challenging when you're talking with them about who Jesus is. So in our Bible, in our Bibles, in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. So clearly that's showing Jesus is God. However, in the New World Translation, it does not say that. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was a God. That one little letter A makes a tremendous difference doctrinally. And so that's um, one of the ways that you can't use John 1, 1 with them um, to argue that Jesus is God because they've changed it. They believe Jesus was initially a pure spirit, But he was the firstborn of God. He was the first thing God created. Um, So God the Father created Jesus. So he was his firstborn. That's how come it's okay to call him the son of God and the firstborn son of God. He's the first creation. They believe Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the anointed one. This happened the moment he was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. He became the Messiah and that he, he took on his mission. They believe you can call him Lord because he holds second in command of God's heavenly organization. So God's heavenly kingdom, Jesus is second in command, so it's okay to call him Lord. And you can call him Savior, because he did come to earth and die for us and open the way for humans to gain eternal life. 
We'll talk about what that means. But he, they do believe you can call him these titles. However, they will never pray to Jesus. You can never pray to Jesus. You always pray to Jehovah. You can pray to Jehovah through Jesus, but not to Jesus. So through a miracle, God the Father sent Jesus to the earth into the womb of the Virgin Mary, miraculously. But they believe that Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel, and this is his earthly manifestation. So Michael the Archangel and Jesus are the exact same. Michael was God's first creation in a spirit form. Then when he came to earth and took on flesh, he was given the name Jesus. But to them, Jesus and Michael are the same. They use a couple different passages to argue this. Um, In Revelation 12 and in Revelation 19, it talks about God's faithful army of angels. And it says in Revelation 12 that Michael is the leader of this faithful army of angels. And in Revelation 19, it says Jesus is the leader. So they say there's only one faithful army, so there can only be one leader. Therefore, Michael and Jesus are the same. But they're just taking it out of context. Then they also say in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, when it's a prophecy about the second coming, it says Christ will come with the voice of an archangel. Well, therefore, he must be an archangel because he has the voice of an archangel. And there's only one archangel ever named in Scripture, and that's Michael. So there's only one archangel, and Christ will come with the voice of an archangel. They must be one and the same. And those are some of the primary scriptures they use to defend that. But you can talk with them about this. I mean, you know, there's definitely evidence in scripture against this. Um, Michael is only mentioned five times and never does scripture explicitly or clearly say that Jesus and Michael are the same. Um, those are some descriptions of what, who Michael is. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, you can also tell them, well, okay, if we're going to take that part of the verse literally, that he comes with the voice of an archangel. Well, the next thing it says is he comes with God's trumpet. So does that mean he's God? Because if he comes with the voice of an archangel and you say he's an archangel, and then it says he comes with God's trumpet, then he must be God. You know, if we're going to take one part literal, then we need to take the whole thing literal. But that's not really even what the whole passage means. But, um, but they just take it out of context. You can definitely challenge them and say, well, what do you, what do you think this means when it says that he comes with God's trumpet? Um, that's one thing. But an even more... I think, clear passage is in Hebrews. Um, The first point before we get to the Hebrews chapter 1 verse is if you recall in Revelations 22, whenever John is writing and he sees the angel all of a sudden before him, he falls prostrate before the angel. And the angel tells him, no, John, you have to get up. Worship is for God alone. So keep that in mind. So the angel does not, he refuses to be worshipped. So then in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 to 10, This is actually clearly saying that Jesus is superior to the angels because it says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son? And then he goes on to say, Let let all the angels of God worship him. So number one, he is saying that there's no angel who God has ever called my son. And then he says all the angels should worship Jesus. But if you're not supposed to worship an angel, like in Revelation 22, then how is it that we worship Jesus? Jesus in this passage but this whole chapter this first part of this chapter is talking about how Jesus is superior to the angels and so you can use that with them now one of the things the New World Translation has done because of this dilemma um, is in Hebrews they've changed the word worship to obeisance but um, or is that how you say that word obeisance Um, obeisance but um, that word just means worship it's just not using worship explicitly if you look at the Greek, the exact two Greek words are used. Proskaino is the Greek word. And so the exact Greek words are used in both places. They just try to, I think, take the reader's eye away from worship by using a different word. But that word means worship. But that's what the New World Translation has done. But there's different, you can definitely approach this with them to some degree. But again, I wouldn't necessarily harp on who Jesus is at the beginning. There's other things that are going to be more important initially in your dialogue. But as you go further into it, you definitely want to show them there's no evidence that Jesus is Michael. All right, and so continuing on about who Jesus is, um, they believe that Jesus is perfect. He was a good teacher. He was a good man on earth. He is the best example of perfect obedience to God. And they believed he preached the good news of the kingdom. This good news is that God would eventually rule over earth and bring endless blessing to all those who are obedient and do his will. They do believe Jesus suffered and was tortured and killed. They believe he he was killed on a stake, not a cross, because a cross is a pagan symbol. And so they they refuse to have crosses, um, have anything to do with crosses. 
I'm not going there's a lot of things you can argue with them against this point because scripture is pretty clear that it's a cross, but I'm not going to spend time on that, but they believe it's a stake, not a cross. They do believe that Jesus died as a ransom for our sins and that he made life on an earthly paradise possible. And we'll come back to talk about what that means. They do believe in original sin. So unlike some different traditions, they do believe in original sin, um, that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and every, every offspring after that inherits an imperfection. And because of this original sin, all humans on earth, all earthly kingdoms, all earthly governments are under the influence of Satan. Satan is the ruler of this world, and everyone's under his influence. With Jesus' death and resurrection, um, they do believe that on the third day Jesus was resurrected by God, but it was only a spiritual resurrection. They do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And once you understand what they believe about death, you may understand a little bit more why. So when Jesus died, like all of us, he was annihilated. They do not believe in an in, in immortal soul. They believe that at death we are completely destroyed. Nothing more exists of you. Nothing more remains. You go into non-existence completely. All humans, including Jesus, went into non-existence. Then after three days, God resurrected him. And really that word means recreated because there was nothing left of him alive or living in existence. They really, God just recreated Jesus. But because Jesus truly was Michael to begin with, when God recreated Jesus, he just recreated Michael spiritually. So there's no bodily resurrection. They say that God the Father um, somehow in a mysterious way hid Jesus' body so that no one would ever find it. <clears throat> so um, then they believe that after, Je after several weeks that he was around spiritually talking with his apostles um, and then he ascended into heaven and when he went to heaven um, Jesus slash Michael one and the same they returned to heaven to be with God the Father now you can definitely definitely dialogue with them about the idea of a spiritual resurrection because Jesus clearly is trying to be emphatic that he is bodily resurrected if you remember in Luke 24 Jesus tells the apostles to feel my wounds in my hands and in my feet and on my side because he's proving that he has flesh and bones. Um, whenever they still doubt, he goes and he cooks them fish and he eats it with them to show them that he has resurrected bodily. And so there's Jesus is very emphatic um, to the apostles that he has resurrected bodily. And I think probably even more telling to me is John chapter 2. When Jesus is giving a prophecy about his resurrection, Jesus says that I will destroy the temple and in three days I will raise it up. And then John, the author of the gospel, writes, but he spoke of the temple of his body. And so John is telling us in verse 21 that Jesus is foreshadowing, prophesying his resurrection in three days after he's killed and then he'll be resurrected bodily. He'll restore the temple, which is his body. So I think these are definitely three passages you can bring up and talk with them about it um, to show that they're, Jesus had a bodily resurrection. That leads us into their understanding of death. All human beings, all men, at death you cease to exist. You go into nothingness, nothing survives. They believe that when scripture talks about soul or when it says body, they're the same thing. They're synonymous. It just means the person. They don't believe in two component parts. Like we believe that we're, we're persons made of body and soul. They do not believe that. We don't have component parts. Body and soul are the exact same thing. They just mean the whole person. And spirit is just a life-giving force that comes in you. That's what gives you life. When the spirit's removed, everything dies. Your body, body, soul are the same thing. They believe the idea of an immortal soul is a doctrine of Satan. They use these two passages largely, but there's other passages they use, but Ecclesiastes 9.5 and then Psalm 146, because these tend to suggest that the dead know nothing, their thoughts shall perish. But if you take them in context, it's not, what it, it, it's not giving you doctrine on the afterlife. But these are the passages they'll use in addition to others. Um, they tell you, though, that yes, we go into non-existence, but there's good news. Um, we all will be resurrected again. And again, resurrected really means recreated because there's nothing of you left um, when you die. So they say, that's the good news. We'll all be recreated. We'll all be resurrected. And so, and then it depends on w how you live your life, where you'll be resurrected too. And we'll talk about that. But they say, that's the good news. You don't have to worry. Don't be going to despair about this idea that we're annihilated um, because you will be resurrected. Now, I'm going to talk about this 
particular issue because I think it's very important, but I want to make sure I get through some of these other things at the end, uh, or to the end. So at the end, I'm going to talk to you about some scripture evidence against their notion um, that the soul is not immortal. I'm going to show you some evidence that shows that it is, um, but I'm going to come back to that if I have time at the very end. But I think it's a very important thing you can challenge them about. So believers, um, what do they believe with the believers? So there's two classes of believers. They're called the little flock and the other sheep believers. They have a work-based theology, so it really depends on how faithful you are um, to God's will told to you through the watchtower. Um, If you're obedient, live a good life, follow the teachings of the watchtower, then you're going to get, you're going to be treated as one of these two classes of believers. We'll talk about what they mean. Um, I'm going to stop for just a second and fill in a couple of these things because I don't want you to get too lost because it starts to get confusing. So God the Father is Jehovah. Jesus is Michael. This pen is not working. Um, He's Michael and he's the first creation. So the firstborn. Holy Spirit is just a force. Um... So Jesus' death was for our sins and for eternal life. Jesus' resurrection was only spiritual, no body. The death of humanity is annihilation. Um, they deny, so I'm going to put no immortal soul. Okay. And that way, because as we go along, I don't want you to get too confused. Um, now for the two different classes of believers. I start to get confusing. So the little flock, the first group, they take it from Luke 12. The little flock. So this is the group of 144,000 who since the time of Christ will be in heaven. So this particular group of 144,000 will have a spiritual resurrection. So they've, been, they've died, they've, anni- they've been annihilated but they'll be resurrected spiritually without the flesh, and they'll, be, they'll go to heaven and be there with God the Father and Jesus. Whenever scripture talks about being born again or being bo- joint heirs of Christ or being members of the body of Christ, those, only, those terms only refer to this group. They don't, don't, don't refer to the rest of us. And you'll find out none of us have a chance to be in this group. Um, so these, this group will help rule heaven with Christ. As of 1935, all this 144,000 have been chosen. So the 144,000 have already been selected and chosen as of 1935. So from 1935 on, no new converts will join this class of the little flock. This 144,000 is taken from 1,000 of the first Christians and then any of the Watchtower faithful who were baptized before 1935. And then they say there's some Christians over the centuries that may fall into this group too. But it's primarily the first thousand or so Christians and then Watchtower faithful before 1935. No, no. But they do tell you there's a few of them left today, but not many. <coughs> but they, I don't, all their presidents that didn't leave are, are there, probably. Um, so the other group is the other sheep from John 10. They use a lot of terminology from the scripture. It's just often out of context, um, as you'll see. But the little flock and the other sheep. The other sheep are all other believers. So any converts since 1935, this group also includes patriarchs before Christ. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all the pre-Christian patriarchs would be in the other sheep. And then other faithful Christians um, that may have existed throughout the centuries. Their ultimate destiny is to be resurrected in the flesh to live eternally on an earthly paradise. So live on an earthly paradise, kind of like the Garden of Eden was uh, before the fall. That's where your destiny would be. You'll be ruled over by Christ and by the little flock who are in heaven, and then you'll live on earth. There's a subsection of this group that's called the great crowd. You read about them in the book of Revelation. Um, This is the group of the other sheep who are still alive at the end of the world. When God comes to destroy the wicked world, this is a group that will still be alive. Just because Revelation does mention this group, um, and I'm not sure. It's taken out of context, so I'm not really sure why um, they use this term. But um, they believe it's those who are still alive when God destroys the wicked world. Okay, so little flock is the 144,000, and they're going to be in heaven spiritually. 
The other sheep is everybody else. They'll be in an earthly paradise in the flesh when they're resurrected. So 144,000 in heaven spiritually and then earthly paradise resurrected in the flesh for believers only. We'll come back to the unbelievers. You can definitely, definitely dialogue with this with them about this because a lot of what they're doing is taking things out of context. So the 144,000, they take that from Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. Again, if they're going to be literal about one part of a verse, they should be literal about the entire part of the verse. You can't have the first half of the verse literal, the second half figurative. So really challenge them about that. How can you have parts of the verse literal, parts figurative? Because Revelation 7 says that 144,000 from every tribe of the sons of Israel would be chosen. In Revelation 14, it says 144,000 of those who have not defiled themselves with women and of those who follow the Lamb. So if we take this literally, it would be Jewish celibate men and likely converts because they followed the Lamb. So this 144,000, if you take it literally, the number, then we should look at the rest of the passage and it's talking about the sons, so men, from the tribes of Israel, so Jewish people, who have not defiled themselves with women, so they have not gotten married, and they follow the Lamb, Jesus Christ. So celibate Jewish male converts, if we're going to take this literally, we should take the whole thing literally. So you can definitely challenge them and ask them what they understand that to mean. Then if you read all of Revelation 7 in context, the 144,000 are actually on earth, um, if you really look at it. When they're talking about who is where, um, the 144,000 are on earth, in Revelation 7, verse 9, the great crowd that's mentioned is too numerous to count. This group is in heaven because it says they're before the throne of God. They're with the angels, with the elders, with the four um, beasts. And then it says their voice cries out from heaven. So there's a lot of evidence that they're taking a lot of this out of context. And so you can definitely draw their attention to that and, and have them read the verse themselves and say, where are the 144,000 and where are the great crowd? Where are they positioned? Are they in earth or in heaven? Because the 144,000 are on earth. The great crowd is in heaven. And then you can also say, because they're saying only 144,000 go to heaven. Was well, that what scripture tells us? Because in Matthew 5, heaven is promised to all who suffer for Christ. All those who are persecuted are promised heaven. In Philippians 3.20, Paul writes that all Christians are promised the citizenship of heaven. And then in 1 John 3, it says, all of God's children will see God as he is. So if, we're not, if there's only a limited number going to heaven, how are these scripture passages accurate? And then Matthew 8, verse 11, tells us that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are in heaven. But it's interesting because they tell us the pre-Christian patriarchs will be among the other sheep who will be on earth. So there's just a few points you can kind of definitely question them about and just ask them what's their understanding, what's their interpretation of what the scripture is telling us. All right, so for unbelievers, what do they believe about unbelievers? These are those humans who are wicked and unwilling to change. So this group, therefore, is not worthy of being resurrected. Their ultimate fate is Gehenna. But when they use the word Gehenna, it means to remain in non-existence. These people will never be brought back to life. Um, and so Gehenna, they say when Jesus is talking about Gehenna, he's only talking about non-existence. He's not really saying some place of torture. For hell, they do not believe in hell. They say hell means the grave, just where the body's buried. It does not mean anything more. They say that um, there is no place of torture and um, the dead just basically cease to exist. They're annihilated. If they're faithful and believers, they'll be resurrected. If they're unfaithful, unbelievers, they're not worthy of resurrection. They'll just remain in non-existence because a loving God could not eternally torture his creatures. And so that's their um, understanding explanation about it. They said that the idea of believing God could eternally punish someone is dishonoring God. So the unbelievers are basically remain non, in non-existence. And hell or Hades just means the grave or the places the body's buried. So you can definitely challenge them about hell because scripture is definitely very clear 
that there will be a torment of fire that is everlasting, that is forever. There will be um, evildoers. They'll be thrown into the furnace of fire where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And again, these are all in talking about the end times after judgment. Uh, you'll have these everlasting fires, eternal torture. Um, Luke 13, um, the workers of iniquity, so the sinners will depart and they will be thrown out of the kingdom of God. And then Mark 9 talks about the fire of Gehenna and it cannot be put out. And it'd be better to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to be thrown into Gehenna where the maggot does not die and the fire is not put out. So again, a lot of indication there is this notion in Scripture, throughout Scripture, um, in Jesus' own words of this place of eternal torment that is meant for those who are unfaithful. So you can definitely challenge them about this teaching of hell. So for the second coming, this is when it starts to get a little bit confusing, I think. So hopefully we can, I'll write it up here so we can kind of follow along. Um, so second coming. What do they believe? What does it mean? And when will it happen? So when will Christ's second com and ha coming happen? It already has. Today they formally teach that in 1914, um, Jesus' second coming, coming did happen. And as I had mentioned earlier, Charles Russell initially believed in 1874. So they did believe that for a time. But today, the formal teaching is 1914, that Jesus Christ's second coming did happen. Christ returned invisibly. And they've kind of gone back and forth about these dates that I'll come back to. But Christ returned invisibly in 1914. His second coming happened. So what does that mean? Um, and before I get to that, is Christ's second coming really invisible? Does Scripture say that it'll be invisible or subtle or that it'll be missed? Well, no, because in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, when Christ comes, will be an archangel's call, a God's trumpet. Believers will be taken up in the clouds to meet Christ. And then in Matthew 24, his second coming will be accompanied by lightning. All the tribes of the earth will see Christ on the clouds, and the angels will be sent with a trumpet and with a call and will gather the elect. So none of that really sounds very subtle or invisible. So you can definitely challenge them about where they're coming with this idea of the second coming being invisible. And I, I'm not going to get into what their response will probably be. We can do that later. But they'll have some responses. But it's at least something worthy of breathing up, bringing up to their attention. That scripture doesn't make it sound like the second coming will be invisible. So then with the second coming, what happens? What does this mean? So to them, it means that when Christ came, he finally took his role as king of heaven. So he, before that time, he was just living in heaven with God the Father, but he was not yet king. So in 1914, he took his place as the rightful king of heaven. Um, and how did this happen? In the great battle in the book of Revelation, which we believe happened, the Catholic teaching is that this is what happened at the beginning of time. Michael and the angels fought Satan and the demons and threw Satan and the demons out of hell. Well, I mean, out of heaven to earth. We, be, uh, we believe that battle took place at the beginning. They believe that battle in Revelation did not take place until 1914. So in 1914, Michael, who's Jesus, and his angels defeat Satan and his demons, and they finally throw them out of heaven. Because up until 1914, Satan and the demons still lived in heaven. So in 1914, the great battle happens. They're thrown out, and Satan and the demons are thrown to earth. And so at that point in 1914, heaven was filled with joy and with peace. And then Christ took his role as king of heaven. And now earth was going to be um, even more greatly ruled by Satan. Had already been ruled by Satan, but even more strongly now, because now Satan is no longer in heaven. He's thrust out with his demons to earth. And so now the earth is going to face great tribulations. Since 1914, we're now in the last days, facing great tribulations. Is that 1914 have anything to do with World War One? No, but the, it didn't initially. Um, in a little bit, I'll show you some of their dates and how they picked it. It didn't initially mean, but they def definitely didn't. They definitely took advantage of World War One happening, but um, it didn't wasn't related to that. They predicted it before World War One. Once World War One started happening, they say, "See, this is what we were predicting," but and they made predictions that world, the world would end after World War One, which it didn't. But um, but they had made that that date before the war had started. Um, so Armageddon, what does that mean? This is another important battle. So we have Christ's second coming happens. He finally rules heaven. Um, Satan's thrown out of heaven. Now Satan's um, thrown to earth. 
Um, the Battle of Armageddon. This will be, hasn't happened yet, but it will be the last great battle when God will destroy all kings and all nations, all the wicked world will be destroyed by God. And then after this battle, they believe Christ's a thousand year reign over heaven and earth will begin. So now Christ will also reign over heaven and earth after this battle. Satan and his demons will be imprisoned for a thousand years so they cannot have any influence. And then during that thousand year reign, the 144,000 will be in heaven ruling with Jesus and then all the other believers will be on earth an earthly paradise being ruled over by Jesus and these others. Okay. Um, so judgment day to them is this thousand year period is called the judgment day. Um, so it lasts for a thousand years while Christ reigns over heaven and earth. This is a time where believers will be expected. So the other sheep who are resurrected to earth will be expected to continue to be obedient to God and continue to be faithful. And then any unbelievers who were not, it was not of their own fault that they didn't believe. They didn't know God. So now they've also been resurrected to have a chance to choose God, to obey God, and, and to um, follow him. And so believers who didn't know God have a chance, unbelievers who didn't know God have a chance to choose him. And the believers who resurrected must continue to obey God. If during this 1,000 years you do not conform to God's will and obey God, you're, you're killed and you're permanently um, annihilated. You'll never be resurrected. But all those who survive this thousand years will be restored to original perfection, like Adam and Eve were before the fall. Then at the end of this thousand years, Satan will be released to test humanity one final time. So all those people who have remained faithful during this thousand years, restored to their original perfection, will be tested one more time. And as long as they resist Satan, or anyone who resists Satan, will be on an earthly paradise forever. Basically kind of like an Eden, Garden of Eden, before the fall, forever. Um, and then all those who fail the test will be annihilated. And then you'll continue to have the 144,000 with Christ in heaven, with everyone else on earth, in this earthly paradise full of happiness and joy and everything you can imagine. And so that's how they see um, the world and the end times playing out. Now, um, I'm going to, in the last little bit, I'm going to focus on a few points of um, discussion with them that are the most important. It'll come in, the dates that they talk about will come into play um, when you start to have conversations with them about their authority. Um, so this is just a brief overview of what they kind of believe. Um, so with Christ's second coming, let me just put it up there real quick so that as we talk about these dates, it won't be as confusing. So I'll put King of Heaven. Um, it's invisible, 1874 is the first date, and then 1914 is the current date, and then there was the great battle in Revelation, Satan thrown to earth, um, this is when the wicked world destroyed by God, so all the wicked kings and nations will be destroyed. Everyone will be killed except Jehovah Witnesses. So um, I'll put all killed except Jehovah Witnesses. So those who are in that great crowd will continue to live. So except Jehovah Witnesses. Um, during his thousand year reign, which is called Judgment Day, um, I'll put JD, Judgment Day, Christ and the little flock will be in heaven and there will be ruling and the other sheep um, must be obedient. So they'll be resurrected. These two groups will be resurrected and they'll be, need to be obedient in order to continue to um, live and not be destroyed permanently. End of the thousand years, they'll be retested. All those who have survived the thousand years and then if they survive, if they do good, they'll have an earthly, earthly paradise. Okay. That way when we talk about these dates, it won't get as confusing, hopefully. Okay, so this is just a brief overview. Um, you can address these, as I pointed out along the way, some different scriptural points you can bring up with them. But the key thing you have to address with them and with most faith traditions is their authority. Because this is who they trust. They trust the Watchtower and they trust their own translation of the Bible. 
and anyone else who's trying to talk to them, they see you as a deceiver, someone who is someone under the influence of Satan, merely trying to deceive them. So if the watchtower is not teaching them something, they will not believe it. So what you need to try to do is challenge the reliability of the watchtower. And that should be one of the first things um, you do in your conversation. Now, sometimes they lead you down a path that you can continue with at first, but at some point you want to draw them to your own questions and start questioning them about the watchtower. Um, you can definitely bring up the New World Translation. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but if you know the history of the Bible and why we have 73 books and why the Protestant books only have 66, bring that up. That's a very important issue that a lot of people who do, do not know the history of. So under, ex, uh, discussing with them where we get the Bible, why they only have 66 books. If theirs is the most accurate translation, then why do they still have seven books that are left, left out? Excuse me, Because history shows 73 books were in, in Scripture for 1,100 years before Luther um, and the Protestant reformers removed the seven books. And then you can also challenge them about their translators. Um, do they have biblical expertise? Um, how is it they trust their own translation rather than others? So you can definitely challenge them about their Bible. But the most important is the watchtower, because no matter what, that's who they trust, is the watchtower. They've, it's been ingrained in their mind that this is the only source um, of God's revelation that you must listen to. They're not allowed to read other religious books in general. Um, if you have pamphlets or books, they're told to refuse them. They don't always, but they're told to refuse any other types of um, documents um, because it, it could be deceiving and, and, and something that you don't want Satan to enter into your house. I heard one former Jehovah Witness saying that he had a pamphlet from a non-Jehovah Witness person. It might have been a Catholic. I can't remember. He left it in his car. He said he even hated getting into his car because he thought Satan was in his car because his pamphlet was there. And so he eventually had to get rid of it because it was driving him crazy that this pamphlet of Satan was in his car. So it's really ingrained in their mind that they should not accept any other um, documents. But you can offer it, and I have offered it. And I don't know whether or not this lady meant to take the documents, but she did. I just kind of put them all in her book, and I made some little comments scripturally in her book, and I put a lot of pamphlets in her book in different sections, like a, the pamphlet on hell, our understanding of hell, our understanding of who Christ is, our understanding of scripture, and put them intermittently throughout her own little book and just said, can you read this and show me where I'm wrong or whatever, and she took them, so I don't, I don't know. Um, she might have thrown them away after I learned more about it. I was like, well, maybe she threw them all away. I don't know, but they do believe it's definitely deceiving. So you need to address the watchtower, and there is definitely a lot of evidence, as I'll show, that they're unreliable, and you can challenge them with this. Find, if you can find the exact um, prints of these online, or at least given the, the references so they can go look them up themselves, you can find old issues of the Watchtower online. And a lot of this may not be known by current Jehovah Witnesses, so it's important to bring this up to them. And I'm going to show you these quotes in full here in a little bit, but just keep in mind the Watchtower does believe that a truth cannot contradict a former truth. They do not believe in this idea that God can change his mind. So when God teaches a truth, it shouldn't contradict a later truth that happens. So a truth today should not contradict a truth from the past. And they also say in their watchtower 1997, Jehovah identifies his true messengers by making the messages he delivers through them come true. This is an important quote because if that's the case, then you have to question some of the predictions they've made. So here are some examples of some of the unreliability. In 1874, so this is an important date because initially Charles Russell said this is when Christ's second coming would, this is when Christ's second coming happened and it happened invisibly and that he took his throne in heaven. And you can find that in this document called the Time of Harvest. Um, there's other documents where he says that. Charles Russell also said initially that the Battle of Armageddon where the wicked world would be destroyed began in 1874 and would end in October 1914. And he said this early on in his life. So before the 1900s, he was making these predictions based on various calculations. Um, and so in 1892, you can see where he's saying the world would end in 1914. Then in 1904, Charles Russell changes his dates and says, well, Christ did come in 1874, but the Battle of Armageddon isn't going to begin until 1914. Then in 1912, he said, yes, I'm still, and he still believes end of the world would happen in 1914 or 1915. So the Battle of Armageddon would happen, and all the wicked world would be destroyed, except for Jehovah Witnesses. And you can see this in various documents 
around 1912. And of course, that's not what happened. Um, now, as um, Peyton had mentioned, World War II, World War I does happen and, and around, around this time. And they do take advantage of that and say, see, it's all happening. It's all coming true. They did predict the end of World War I would be the end of the world. Um, that was the Battle of Armageddon, but that obviously didn't take place. They, didn't, they then started to say that World War II would be the end of the world, but that's not what happened either. Um, when they predicted Christ's second coming, so I'm going to show you how this flip-flops. So this goes against their own teaching that you shouldn't contradict former truths and that what God tells you through his channel of communication should come true. So in, up until 1929, they believed Christ came in 1874. From various documents. Then in 1930s, they start to say, well, no, Christ's second coming happened in 1914, not, 19, not 1874. Then they flip flop again in 1937. There's a document that says, no, he came in 1874. And they flip flop again in 1943. And from this point on, they abandoned the 1874 date and said that 1914 is when Christ's second coming happened and he returned invisibly. So there's some flip-flop there that you can definitely challenge them about and say, well, you know, this doesn't make sense if God's revealing to you what's happening and what's going on, how you can flip-flop. Then other failed prophecies, and they have a lot, and I'm going to show you at the end a link where you can go to to see a lot of these. These are just some of them. So they believed in 1889 that all, all kingdoms of the world would, end by 19, would, would take place by 1914. So the wicked world would be destroyed by 1914. In another document in 1918, and that obviously didn't happen in 1914, in 1918, they say that all apostates and everyone of all other religions would not survive 1920. So that they believe that everyone would convert and become Jehovah Witnesses or be killed by 1920. Then in 1926, this, another edition of the same book came out and they changed their wording. They were less specific about the dates because 1920 came and went and nothing had happened. So they changed it and just basically said that all apostates and all those of other religions would not survive the times of trouble. So they became less specific. But you can see how that was a failed prophecy of 1920. Then in um, 1920, they predicted that in 1925, you would see the resurrection of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That didn't happen. And then in, 1970, in 1966, they predicted that in 1975, Armageddon would take place. And this is actually a really big deal. Um, you know, talking to people who were alive during this time, they remember a lot of the, the discussion about this because people were really selling things, really preparing for the end times to happen. Um, and so in 1975, they predicted Battle of Armageddon. In 1968, they said that the autumn of 1975, the Battle of Armageddon will be over and the thousand year reign of Christ will have begun. If these dates are off, it's only by weeks or months. So again, they're really um, uh, emphasizing this, the coming of this 1975 date. And so again, you have people not getting married. They decide just to go and evangelize about Jehovah Witness faith instead of going and living their life because they want everyone that they know that there's close to them to survive this battle because they know that only Jehovah Witnesses will survive. So there's a lot of evangelizing happening around this time. Um, some of their teachings about marriage, which are on your little handout, um, were really being emphasized that, you know, don't get married. It's better to go and just evangelize. Um, you know, get your life in order and prepare for 1975 um, because that's when Armageddon will take place. And, of course, that didn't happen. Um, one of their documents says that by 1880, um, all the signs of the end times had already started. The wars and pestilence and earthquakes, um, immorality. But now, if you look at their document, they say, no, prior to 1914, it was time of peace. Things were great. It's now, since 1914, that the end times have begun. And when you read their documents, they definitely emphasize, you know, look around you. You see all the wars and all the earthquakes. Look at the immorality and the way people are behaving. These are just evidence of the end times. Um, and so they really emphasize that these are the signs of the times of how you know the end times have started. But it's interesting to see that they've kind of flip-flopped on these teachings. In 1968, again, um, talking about the end of the world in 1975, um, and it hasn't happened, and because it hasn't happened, from around the 1970s, they really stopped, 1975 and on, they stopped being as specific about their dates. So now when they talk about the end times, they say that um, 
they're going to be more careful with dating. And so now Armageddon is simply imminent. It just means it's imminent. So they have a little bit more wiggle room with the dates. And so Russell himself, just looking at all these dates and this unreliability, Russell wrote that if we were following a man, undoubtedly it would, it would be different with us. Undoubtedly one human idea would contradict another. But with God, there's no variableness. A new view of truth can never contradict a former view of truth. So Russell himself wrote that, and you can see in their history that they're, that's something that's a problem. Now, because of some of their failed prophecies, they've made some comments that um, the men of the governing body, the men of the governing body are not infallible, they're not inspired. So they've kind of made those statements. They've said that the governing body does consist of anointed Christian men, but they're not inspired, they're not infallible. So they've made these comments, like in the 1990s, but they've still continued to make other comments like this in 1997, that Jehovah is the grand identifier of his true messengers. He identifies them by making the messages he delivers through them come true. So there's still this idea that the, these messages should still come true. In 1931, Jehovah God has made known to his anointed ones in advance what these scriptures mean. So he's given them the ability to interpret these inspired scriptures. So they've kind of pulled back a little bit on how strongly they're pushing some of their teaching in some ways, but in general, most of their documents are still very adamant that the Watchtower um, is the voice of God. And then Russell even said, you know, he's not presenting his own truths. He's God's mouthpiece. And that's how they continue to see him to see themselves today, the Watchtower. And so um, the other thing about their authority that you can bring up that they don't all know is that Russell and Rutherford were very big into pyramidology. So um, pyramidology was a hot topic around the 1790s. 1790s, Egyptian discovery started to happen. And they started to find a lot of these Egyptian remains, the Egyptian pyramids, a lot of the Egyptian artifacts. And it began, began growing even greater in 1880s whenever um, England and the United States occupied part of Egypt. So Britain had occupied parts of Egypt. So they started to make even more discoveries in the 1880s. So it became a very big thing to learn about the Egyptian artifacts. Well, Russell was really big into um, pyramidology. And he believed that the Great Pyramid um, was a, giving us an outline of God's plan. He traveled to Egypt twice, and he made a lot of measurements of the pyramid, of the walkways, the passageways, the different um, components of the pyramid. And he even says, this helped me make my calculations for 1914 dating. And he says that, um, I'll read you his quotes. And they used the pyramidology to make doctrinal decisions um, and to help them make some decisions about what God was telling them. And so Russell, in 1910, he wrote that the Great Pyramid is a great witness to the Lord. And the Great Pyramid is an outline of the plan of God. And so these are all documented in, their, in the Watchtower um, documents. Um, Joseph Rutherford also believed in the pyramidology for a short time, but he did eventually abandon it in 1928, and he says that you can no longer study pyramidology. It's Satan's Bible. You're not allowed to follow it. Um, in their own documentation, they do admit that Russell was into this. They do admit that Russell um, was into pyramidology, but they never admit that Joseph Rus Rutherford was, although you can um, document um, like in the Watchtower, 1922 and 1925, that's when Joseph Rutherford was president. Um, but, and they're making these same statements. But they'll, they'll acknowledge Russell was into this somewhat, um, but they don't really acknowledge that it continued to exist once Russell died. So again, you can bring this into, their, um, into your discussion to really question the reliability. He's making these calculations and predictions based on the pyramids. Um, and seeing the pyramids as something that God's given us to make revelations to us about truth. Okay, um, I wanted to spend like, since we got a little, start a little bit late, I want to spend like maybe two minutes on um, the immortal, immortal soul idea um, so you can kind of um, talk to them about that. Um, and again, use their own resources because they'll trust them. Show them the Watchtower documents. Their job is to convert you. And so um, you want to definitely ask them, why should I trust the Watchtower? I mean, they're wanting to convert you. Um, so say, well, if you want me to trust the Watchtower, show me why I should with all these different issues in the past, the failed prophecies and um, predictions that never came true and some of the things that are being said. So definitely bring that up to them. Um, but with the immortal soul, I wanted to give you a few um, points about how you can address this with them because it is an important issue. Um, 
And I think there are some good points that you can make with them in conversation about it. Um, so in Ecclesiastes 9.5, this is one big passage they use because it says the dead know nothing in this, in this passage. But if you look in the context of this chapter, um, the author of Ecclesiastes, he kind of is going back and forth into this dialogue, um, it seems. He kind of talks about a person who, from one worldview, believes in God. And at other times, he's talking about, like, from a worldview of someone who either doesn't believe in God or who's just fallen into despair. Well, chapter 9 is a chapter on despair. This person has this idea, looking at the world, he's just fallen into despair. And I'll just paraphrase kind of what this chapter is talking about. He's basically saying, we should eat, drink, and be merry, because why does it matter? All men will die, and nothing will change that. Bad things are going to happen to you in life, no matter what you do. So whether you believe in God or not, we all die. So let's just enjoy this life while we have it. And so he says that as long as you're alive, that's what we need to accept and appreciate and enjoy. Um, and he just says that, um, he even says in this passage that it doesn't matter if you're good or bad. We all end up with the same outcome. We all die. So let's just enjoy life while we can. So this chapter 9 is just looking at, at, from a perspective of someone who's just in despair, who really doesn't have an appreciation of the afterlife. And so to look at verse 5 and say, oh, the dead know nothing. That's our doctrine on the immortal soul. This isn't really teaching us doctrine. This is just someone's kind of worldview, the way their outlook on life. And so you have to be careful when you're just taking one verse out of context. If you look at the entire chapter, one of the other things that happens um, is in verse 2. So the Jehovah Witnesses, like us, believe that it does matter. It does matter what you do. It does matter how you live your life. If you're good or evil, it does matter. But in verse 2, um, this author in chapter 9 says, all have the same outcome, whether you're righteous or wicked. And then verse 9 says, just go on, enjoy your futile life. We all die no matter what. So if we believe, like the Jehovah Witnesses believe, that it does matter what you do, then we should take a step back and say, wait a minute, are we understanding this author to be being literal in this chapter 9? Is chapter 9 truly telling us the reality of the situation if he says in verse 2 that it doesn't matter how you live? So we don't agree with verse 2 that it doesn't matter how you live. So are we going to automatically then agree with verse 5 that the dead know nothing? Well, no. I mean, you, can, um, you have to look at the context of this, state, of this passage and of this book as a whole. And if you read the book of a whole, he has other messages that he'll bring, but it's not really to give you a doctrine of the afterlife. And so having said that, um, uh, let me skip through this. So when you, when you can bring that up to them and say, we've got to take a step back. and Let's look at scripture as a whole, not just this Ecclesiastes verse. Um, and so in scripture, um, you'll see the word body and soul used throughout scripture. Sometimes the word soul is used that sometimes means literally the soul, but sometimes it also does mean just the person. Um, sometimes scripture will use body to mean the person. Um, so it, scripture, you have to look at context of how it's using a particular word. Um, but if you look at scripture as a whole, then you can, I think, show them that their idea that the body and the soul are the exact same thing, just the person, is, is wrong. So if you look at passages like Matthew 10, verse 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So the key takeaway from this point is there's something that can kill the body, but can't kill the soul. So they must be two separate parts. Um, you don't necessarily have to go into the rest of the passage too much to talk to them about it, but there's something that can kill the body and something that can't kill the soul. So there are two separate parts. There's two components. And then Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, um, John's talking about how he sees the souls under the altar and they're crying out to God, you know, asking when, it, when, God, when is God going to um, basically... Um, those who had martyred them on earth, or the martyrs, the souls under the altar, when is God going to um, basically um, punish those people that had killed them? So the souls are crying out. The souls are aware of what's going on on earth. To them, they believe this dead or dead. They know nothing about what's going on. So these souls are very well aware of what's happening. In 2 Corinthians 5, um, verse 8, Paul says that I want to be away from the body to be present with the Lord. So there's this sense that he's not saying... I want to be away from the body and die and then wait till I'm resurrected to be with Christ. He's saying that as soon as I die, I'm going to be with Christ because that's where he would rather be. But he knows that God has more plans for him in store that he needs to stay 
with the Corinthians and others to continue preaching, but he wants to be, he, he, he almost prefers to die because he wants to be with God. So there's this suggestion that immediately he would be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5, um, verse 23, Paul writes and he separates that your whole spirit and soul and body may preserve, be preserved blameless. So if body and soul were not separate parts, it would be very repetitious for Paul to split these out as three different components. Um, so soul and body here seem to be two separate components. And then spirit is like we mean it, our life force, what gives us life, but soul and body are separate. And then this one, I think, is one of the most important. John 11, verse 26, Jesus says, And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So if it's true that we die and we're annihilated, nothing of us remains, then how can Jesus say this? If it's true, um, in order for what Jesus is saying to be true, then some part of us must never die. Something must be immortal. And we know our bodies die and our bodies become corrupt. So something must live on. There must be this immortal soul. Otherwise, Jesus is lying. If there's no immortal soul, if there's nothing immortal about us, then Jesus is lying in this passage. Um, so I think you can bring those up. And then if you want to bring up the parable of Lazarus and the rich man where Jesus talks about what happens in the afterlife, they say it's not true. It's just a parable and it's just something, a story that Jesus made up. But if you look at all of Jesus' parables, they all are based on real things and real events. So you can bring that one up, or you can bring up the Transfiguration, which shows Moses, who we know died, who's alive, aware of what's going on, and, and talking with Jesus. And they don't necessarily teach that Moses is going to be one of the resurrected spiritually in heaven, so you can question them about that too. So that's kind of the gist of it. I'll just kind of summarize, basically, really, really address their authority, the Watchtower, the New World Translation, Challenge them verse by verse um, after you've done that, um, and then gradually show them Christian doctrine. It's not as important at first to just teach them what we believe necessarily. Challenge them about why they trust their authority, why they're trusting the watchtower, um, so that then they can be open to what it is you, you're teaching them and sharing with them. And then eventually let them read the Gospels from our own version of the Bible. Then eventually you can get into talking about Christ and his deity, the deity of Christ and Trinity. And then that's it. Let me see. And just be patient, kind. I mean, they're all very good people. Um, it's going to be very hard for them to leave Jehovah Witness because if they leave, they're disfellowshipped, which means the other Jehovah Witnesses around them can never speak to them, can never talk to them, cannot even say hello to them. So if they were to leave and become an ex-Jehovah Witness, they're basically um, going to be shunned. And so it's going to be a hard thing for them. So just be patient with them and always be loving. Can they ever go back? To becoming, uh, like, fall away and then go back? I mean, I'm sure they would let them come back, but they would have to prove that it's something that is genuine and not just trying to infiltrate or something like that. I mean, I'm sure they could go back. Hopefully, they left because they realize the issues and don't want to go back. But these are just different sites. Um, their own websites at the bottom, other websites that have a lot of these prophecies and um, failed prophecies and issues. And then you'll have the handouts with all the different other beliefs of interest, like the ideas with blood and why they don't receive transfusions, and they won't salute the flag, they won't say the Pledge of Allegiance, some of those other interesting beliefs. All right, any other questions, thoughts, comments, or as you're looking over those other beliefs, if you have questions about those as well. It is